a disclaimer first, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the Scottish Government, I'm speaking on behalf of me, my perception of how this has affected policy. And I want to say one or two things at the start about the success of the centre, because it's been a huge success, partly I think because of the structure, it's not the creature of any one organisation, it doesn't have to follow university rules or whatever, it has the ability to be intellectually curious in whichever uh, dimension it wants to. And it's chosen to try and understand Glasgow's health, which is a very rich seam of, for exploration, as we've heard. It's influencing policy, but my experience has been the more scientifically robust you can be, the more likely you are to have politicians sit up and take note. When you can show them data about which they cannot argue, they cannot impose a sort of left-wing, right-wing um, uh, uh, interpretation, they have to confront it and they have to think about how they deal with it. And so far, what we've seen, I think, tells us that there's a need to do things differently and we need to create a different dynamic around the question of inequality. Because I think that's at the heart of this, not health inequalities. Health, in, health inequality is just an emergent property of a chaotic and complex system. Inequality in a number of dimensions is what we're dealing with here. And I also want to, we have one long stream of work that's happened in the centre that hasn't been mentioned at all today is the SOBID study, Psychological, Social and Biological Determinants of Ill Health. And quite by chance, Jennifer sent out the final report this morning. And I just want to make a couple of quotes from the summary. The growing body of evidence presented in this study reinforces the impact of poor early life circumstances and low socioeconomic childhood status on the accumulation of risk factors. Clear association between socioeconomic status and cognitive performance. Get it wrong in early years and children are on a failing trajectory. And also the importance of personality, and I want to come back to that, the importance of the individual and how the individual reacts to the world round about him as a, as a determinant of health outcomes have been shown very clearly in a whole stream of very, very interesting papers. But I want to talk a bit about what we've heard. What we've heard today, um, well, it's very clear we're dealing with a complex system. And what I would suggest is that there are, enough, there are enough similarities in the different presentations, enough similarities in the theme to suggest that we probably have a pretty, pretty good grasp of what's going on. The problem is, and we can keep on examining it and keep on seeing how much does that influence the outcome and so on. The reason we keep on doing that is because we haven't quite grasped how we change it. What I would argue is, it's less important to carry on studying the why than it is to begin to study the how do we change it question. And improving complex systems, what we've learned over the years in trying to improve those complex systems, and healthcare is one of them with the patient safety programme, build secure knowledge of the problem, and I think we're just about there, build the will to change, Make sure the community, the so that society at large, wants to change. Decide what the execution strategy is, what you're going to do to make the change happen, and then drive that process by showing people continually whether or not it's happening in your area. What is it? What do you want to change by how much, by when? For example, can we make Scotland a violence-free society within a generation or sooner? I think we can. So why don't we set about doing it? Setting aspirational goals with a, a, a set of drivers that we want to influence. And I'd want to suggest that what has come out of the work of the study for me is that what determines well-being in life, to a certain extent it's factors peculiar to the individual, nutrition, development and so on, to a certain extent, it's what we would call the traditional social determinants of health, the environment in which we're in. But the 
interaction between the two, the way the individual responds to the one round about him, that process of interchange between person and external world, and how some people react well to adverse circumstances when many don't, is the key to how we begin to take things forward. This is a slide produced by a colleague, Bent Lindstrom, who is the world's first professor of salutogenesis. Salutogenesis meaning creation of health. And what he's done here is that under the salutogenesis umbrella, he's put all of these theories that have all been talked about. Resilience, empowerment, social capital, quality of life, learned optimism, all this kind of stuff, emotional intelligence, sense of coherence will to meaning. All of these theories that have all been discussed over the past 30, 40 years all have very, very similar and mutually supportive theories underpinning them. And to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter which one of these you pick as your means of beginning to understand what's going on as long as you have that kind of perspective in your thinking. And I've, in trying to simplify things, I've produced a far too simplified outline of what I believe is going on and why I think we have to think differently. And the first thing is to say is that poor health is an outcome of a set of processes, as is educational failure, as is criminality. Inequalities in each of these in our society are the outcome of a set of processes. And certain things are consequences of those outcomes, okay? You could have I've got worklessness, which leads to poverty, which leads to failure in an inverted commas there. I think poverty is an outcome of inequality rather than a particular cause of it. Because we all know poor people have been extremely successful. My father, for one. His father was a miner. My father ended up with degrees in physics and mechanical engineering and so on. What is it that allows some poor people to survive and flourish when many don't? So poverty, I think, is more of a consequence of these outcomes. The causes that we've identified are very much focused in early years, and we've got a set of mechanisms that are in place there that Antonovsky and, and, you know, the, and the Sobid study have highlighted. But that's only part of it. You put that cycle up and clearly that kind of failure leads to chaotic early years for the next generation. So there's intergenerational downward spiral in performance and increasing inequality in the children who experience that kind of thing. But that's the psychological, that's the internal side of the, the coin. What about the external? factors, as David has mentioned, the important structural determinants of this. And I think to remind you that Antonovsky didn't just talk about sense of coherence, apologies if you can't read this, he also had this idea of resistance resources, the external things that helped people through life acquire a sense of manageability and meaningfulness in their lives. And you could then look at our too simple model and say, well, actually, sense of coherence, helping to make life manageable and meaningful and understandable here. And the generalized resistance resources wrap up that whole process. And those generalized resistance resources include obvious things like well-being, social support, sense of identity, um, recently got hold of um, Viktor Frankl's book, um, Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl was a, 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 a psychoanalyst uh, from uh, Vienna who was in a concentration camp during the war. And he, describing his own very personal struggle, that interaction between him with his beliefs around what made him unique, as opposed to the horrible environment he was in. Very, very realistic and huge resonances with some of the issues that we're dealing with. 
religion, philosophy, belief systems which anchor people and provide them with a set of answers. We don't talk enough about spirituality in all of this. We don't talk enough about the cultural drivers of well-being. We talk about hospitalization rates and unemployment rates. We talk about concrete things we can measure. But actually what drives a lot of this cultural stability, philosophy, meaning, purpose, can't measure it, so we just ignore it. And I think the time has come to be open about that. I've been delving back into literature from 1960s, 1970s. Really, really good stuff that's been swept aside by the sort of um, revolution around gadgets and things that you play with. And I, <laughs> Alvin Toffler, Future Shock, and Ivan Illich, you know, these were books that were, you know, underneath my pillow in the 70s. And I just got a quote again to remind myself um, of Future Shock. Toffler said, to survive, to avert what we have termed Future Shock, we, we must become infinitely more adaptable and capable than before. We must search out totally new ways to anchor ourselves for all the old roots, religion, nation, community, family, and profession are now shaking under a hurricane impact of accelerating change. What happened in West Central Scotland that David and Bruce showed earlier on? Men who built ships, men who had jobs with purpose and meaning, men who valued their existence as creators of these huge things, lost their jobs and were sent to Easter House and Drum Chapel and so on, and left with nothing. And that whole uprooting effect has thrown this cycle into hyperdrive. Loss of purpose, loss of meaning, loss of sense of humanity. We're in a very interesting time in Scotland now. We need to create a narrative that says the public sector has to change what it does. The public sector has to stop doing things to people in communities and start doing things with them. What we've termed co-production, this business of growth in communities where three or four people get together, light a spark and say, yeah, I want to do this, I want to change this, I want, I want to help parents who take drugs get their children successful at school and typically that will start with four or five and a few months later there's 40 or 50 people in the room. Public sector needs to co-produce that process. Too often we tell people how difficult it is to help them. We can't do this, we can't do that. The only thing we can say is can't, we should just shut up and let them get on with it. But ideally we should be building that connectedness that Pete talked about in a much more concrete and systematic way. So the lessons from all of this are doing things with people, not to them. Um, person's internal strengths are built, this assets notion, which I think of as in, internal assets. You know, people think of them as external assets, but the assets that people have in their soul, in their mind, they're revealed to them through the building up of secure, prolonged relationships. And that's based on dialogue, genuine exchange with other people that leads to trust and them acquiring a sense of, of self-esteem. This person's taking an interest in me. I must be worthwhile. So we need to change that public sector dynamic and the other thing we need to start talking about is that we should do this not because it saves money. It drives me up the wall. If anyone tells me again about the population, the demographic time bomb and things like that, I don't want to know about that. We should do this because it's the right thing to do, okay? It's just to look after people. Every single 
intellectual tradition, whether it be humanism or a religious tradition. Going back to Buddha, talks about compassion as the main driver of well-being in society. Do unto others. 113 out of 114 books of the Quran talk, is introduced by invoking God the most compassionate. Buddha talks incessantly about compassion. Rabbi Hillel, in the, when asked to, 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 to summarize the Torah while standing on one leg, said, uh, do not do to others that which is hateful to you. The rest of the Torah is merely explanation. Okay? That's what we need to drive things. We know what, what works. We don't need to analyse it much more. We just need to get out and find ways of putting it into practice. The idea of co-production, the idea of people looking after each other, the idea that Glasgow has fewer volunteers per head of population than Liverpool and Manchester is a starting place. I want you all to go out and volunteer this weekend. Okay, and that's a start. Thanks very much. <laughs>